What's up, Dibbles? j Dog back with another goddamn fucking interview. And we're here to pound some fucking metal with Dan a fucking Exciter here in Cleveland. So, Dan, you were pretty uh, enthusiastic up there on stage about Cleveland, which I found kind of funny is, uh, like, one other interviewer said on the channel, goes to uh, shows, and he says there's a bunch of statues watching the band. Is that the way it is in Canada, then? <laughs> no, actually, Canada's come a long way. Uh, everywhere we go, it's, it's pretty cool. But I'll tell you, I've had 40 years to fucking remember Cleveland. And um, I was telling Daniel DK before the show, where do we get to Cleveland? Like he said on stage, you know, it's always been a special place for us. Back at the Variety Theater with Motorhead, and then after that with, with Megadeth. And before that at the Pop Shop, right? And, um, you know, touring across the states, you got the main cities like Chicago and L.A. and New York and stuff, but always in the 80s, when we hit Cleveland, it was like, Jesus Christ, this is fucking great. And all these years later, man, I stood up there on the riser tonight, I looked out, and it could have been 1984, and I was just blown away. And it's the Cleveland I remember, and it, it's, it's a special night. I'm always going to remember, and it's a special night on this tour. What a, yeah, uh, because I'm... I'm not as young as that 14-year-old earlier, but I wasn't around in the early 80s. I was right. born in 85. What was the year, because you said Motorhead, was that the year that you guys played with Merciful Fate as well? Yes, uh, that was 1984. So that was Merciful Fate's first U.S. tour. That's right. That's so right. Motorhead headline, and then you guys both opened? No, that... then Merciful Fate, and then we opened. We were the opening act for the tour. Okay. We were the first band on. And that tour came through Cleveland? Yes, okay. at the Variety Theater, where the ceiling came down that everybody remembers. and. Uh, um, it's record volume and stuff, and I was standing beside Motorhead Soundman when the fire marshal shut it down, and he said, it's 110 dBs on the street! <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's funny you bring up the whole Cleveland thing, because it's walk right in front of, right in front of the camera. <laughs> yeah, I, guess, I guess he gets an exemption to yeah. the band, too. <laughs> oh. Band exception. Two for the price of one, Jano. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho. Um, it's funny because uh, I don't know if you ever seen this. I think it's on the, um, the, the 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 live Overkill CD. It was recorded in Cleveland, Ohio, and Bobby says the same thing. Supposedly, like his favorite place to play is as well as Cleveland. Well, there you go, man. There you go. It's it's there's just something about it. The enthusiasm with the crowd and just crazy fucking metalheads, and it's so cool that you have all these memories from back then, and you come back all these years later, and nothing's changed. Sure, Except sure. you know you get a lot of younger people, which is great. The future of metal is great. Now, speaking of uh, bands like Merciful Fate and Venom, because you guys are at the very, very early forefront of when heavy metal was in its extreme infancy, literally helped spawn the, the genre. Yeah. Did you, w when you saw like the whole, like, some people call it like proto black metal now, bands like Merciful Fate, Venom, Celtic Frost, you were still young when that was coming up, but yeah. you came from the 70s, listening to like, yeah. like hard rock and the early heavy metal, that. Sure. Did you, did you like that Merciful Fate, Venom stuff, or were you like, ah, I don't oh, Of like, course. I mean, uh, yeah, definitely. I'm a fucking huge Merciful Fate fan. And Venom. And of course, we were the first band to tour with Venom in 1986 in, uh, in Brazil. And it's a famous tour. We were the first bands to, to go right across Brazil. And uh, um, we met the guys in Venom. And Kronos is still a great friend of mine. I have tons of respect for him. Merciful Fate. Yeah, we, we were there with all, all of that surgence um, of, of that style of metal. And then as the years went on, you know, it got heavier in the death metal and yeah. the black metal and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, oh, definitely, yeah. Well, with that being said, Jay, you, like I said, you were there at the very beginning yeah. from hard rock to changing over to now this new genre of heavy metal. Yeah. And then from there, you guys were like arguably one of the first bands of a subgenre of right. heavy metal being yeah. called speed metal. Yes. Then you had thrash metal, death metal. What did you think of the progression as the years are going by, as you're getting into 84, 85 with Possessed, Seven Churches, like that? Like, what it, did you did you like the direction of metal? Or did you think it was getting carried away? Like, what was your take no, on it? No, 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 no. Back then, of course, we loved it. Uh, for us, you know, as you said, we'd come up with the hard rock and, you know, Judas Priest, maybe in Black Sabbath of the 70s. But what changed Exciter into getting into Heavy Metal Maniac, which we wrote in 1982, was the new wave of British heavy metal. Okay. That was our biggest influence, and for us, we just sort of took that and went a little bit faster and did a little bit more extreme, whatever the hell we did, we didn't realize what we were doing at the time. But it was a very special time. Um, 
just to see it transform into speed metal and thrash metal, but the new wave of British heavy metal was still there. And in the years to come, it branched off into a lot of different categories, but it's still metal, you know, yeah, and, and it's all good. It grew, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, Metallica, Slayer, and Exodus, and, and it, of course, after that, Megadeth and stuff, it was just a surge all over the world. And it was so cool just to be part of it and to see it. It was, uh, it was pretty magical. Now, did you, uh, who, who came up with the term, like, calling you guys and just, like, do you, know, do you remember what year it was when people started officially calling your guys self and the musical genre speed metal? Do you know that term? Like, you guys didn't start calling yourself that, did you? No, we didn't call ourselves anything. We were just a heavy metal band at the time. The, the, the labels didn't come out until, you know, our first album, Metallica, and then Thrash and Speed Metal and stuff. And to be honest with you, Exciter never really went as fast as any of those other bands. Mm -hmm. So we never considered ourselves a thrash band, but, um, at, you know, we were more, we're huge Sabbath fans. So with songs like Black Witch on the first album, we always yeah. had a slower, heavy thing. We had a couple of mid-tempo songs and fast stuff. There were a lot of bands that came after us to be like all fast or one medio tempo. And, it, you know, we always had the Sabbathy boom thing, but um, yeah. Uh, but either way, yeah, you liked how it fucking turned out, so, oh, you know. fuck, yeah. But we had no idea at the time, you know. Things yeah. were happening around us. But like I said, the new years to come, it really, oh, you can't go to this concert because they're heavy, they're hair metal, and you can't go to here because they're that. Yeah, well, they the black metal and the death metal, and you can't be seen here, and the Slayer fans can't go to that. And it's just well, your time, bullshit. Especially when Heavy Metal Maniac around. There was a, um, again, I wasn't around at that time, from my understanding, there was a division between the metalists and the punks, too, right? Like, they didn't, yeah. they, then they're like, they didn't like unite until a little later, right? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, I remember uh, our early shows, there was, there was punks showing up. And if you look at the thrash shit, you know, the punks fucking influenced a lot of it. Yeah. And I'll tell you, on that Motorhead Merciful Fate tour, that was our first tour with Motorhead. And the punks were showing up in droves. And then later in 86, we toured with Motorhead in, in Europe. And the same thing, the punks were coming out, the Mohawks and shit. And it, it started to kind of go in but you know a lot of thrash bands speed metal bands all a lot to punk so with that being said yeah you were seeing because technically speaking you started before bands like metallica and slayer and it seemed like and i've heard like interviews and even on like the uh heavy metal uh heavy metal maniac uh reissue cd there's a um there's a press interview on the disc to mm -hmm. have and it's you know it's back in the day and you guys were talking about like it seemed like you had a harder time getting like press info and and uh record labels looking at you which kind of seems weird to me because it seemed like when this music was so new labels and press at that time were like holy shit like almost knew instantly to grab onto it but it seemed like you guys didn't get caught on to like metallica slayer well, Venom, i'll tell you why i'll tell you why right now it's because we're from canada and we're from ottawa canada it was a government town and holy shit man there was no fucking music industry there and we, we sent that Heavy Metal Maniac demo all across Canada. And we got a, I still have a stack of uh, record company replies telling us to get day jobs and all this shit. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Or we have Anvil, we don't need you, Attic Records, all this shit. Canada just fucking laughed at us. Then Mike Barney from, you know, obviously from San Francisco um, signed us. Things were happening quicker in the U.S. And now when you're from Canada... And when you're from Ottawa, where the no music industry, we couldn't just go downtown and knock on a do record company's door or get management, proper management or whatever, or fucking record. We were in Hillbillyville back then. Yeah. It's not like that now, but it, as far as the music industry goes, it had to pick up and go somewhere else. So it took, it, we lagged behind a lot. And if it wasn't for Mike Varney and Shrapnel Records and you know, Heavy Metal Maniac took off, and then, of course, Megaforce signed us after that. But it was the U.S. and Europe that really, really took us, uh, that really got, our, got us. So you're basically going. saying if you were from the U.S., there's a high likelihood you guys would be even bigger than you are, more popular. Probably. And yeah. would have happened faster. Which um, would make sense, because to me, in my opinion, it's just my, it's all personal take, is... Um, like the first four exciters, I think those are way better than the first four Megadeths. I like Megadeth, you know, yeah. early Megadeths, but I just thought those are way better, but yet Megadeth in the, is in the big four of them. Yeah, you know of course. I mean? yeah. So. Well, that's a matter of personal opinion. Correct, yeah. Um, people ask me that shit, and they go, you know, how do you feel about that? And I always say, you know what? 
They're fucking great bands, man. It's not like, oh, I should be there and they shouldn't yeah. be there. They're there for a fucking reason. And, and uh, I would never put them down for that. And God bless them. And I love them. And they're all my friends. I, I wish I was there. But um, I'm just happy to still be here now and to play like Cleveland tonight and have a little piece of it. Maybe we weren't the big form. We didn't go off and make it big. But it is what it is. And uh, there's nothing you can do about it. And, yeah, no, of course. But I'm really proud of how first album really stood the test of time so from my understanding is um the first four albums which is what i'm a big fan of your fifth record you guys basically considered a turd and then <laughs> you basically and then you basically left the band soon yeah. after and in that meantime i mean i know that was something you you've, you've mentioned you, you don't really want to talk about which i understand and you've probably been asked that a million times my question is i never heard anyone ask if you guys had a little bit of you weren't getting along at the time or weren't agreeing on music, when was it 2015 when it was all original three guys? Yeah. How did you how did you guys like almost like for example, you got Venom. The three right. guys are not yeah. getting along. There's the Venom Inc. and there's Venom. Right. It seemed like you guys kinda whatever differences you had, you patched it and you got yeah. it back together. How did you manage it? Because a lot of times some guys they're too stubborn in their ways and yeah. how did you guys manage to do that? Like, um, to get to back, back together, like, let's well, we're gonna do it, all three of us. You yeah. Know what I mean? Well, we had a little talk. I went and saw John Ricci, and uh, I just said, let's fucking bury the 80s and everything, and we put everything aside, and um, and we did it, and yeah. Well, then what happened a few years? Because now you got the you got the younger buck on yeah. guitar. Well, after what? five years with John, uh, health problems or whatever, um, you'd have to ask him that. He left the band, and within a couple of months after he left the band, we had uh, Hell's Heroes gig. Okay. So Daniel DK, it's not like we we went out. Well, we put the word out, and guitarists were sending stuff in. But Daniel DK goes back very far with us. Uh, we know him since he was a lot younger, from our hometown, and we know his family and his whole background. And when he phoned, we were just at the point where we we're going to start trying out guitarists, and we had guitarists sending us stuff from all over the world. And he called us up, and it's like. I called up Al and I said, Daniel called me up, man. And we both went, he's in. And we didn't even try him out yet. Okay. You know, we're like, he's in. And he was in Toronto and we're in Ottawa. So he came to Ottawa and <coughs> we did the set for Hell's Heroes, the whole thing. And he was in. And, and no offense to all the guitarists that, that wanted to be an exciter, but it was like Daniel DK, holy shit, man. You know, I get a lot of submits of uh, people we're saying. so fucking happy that, that he joined the band and he took the band to the next level. And, it, you know, it's not like, oh, we got this guitarist, now we got to do a background check on him. What's yeah, yeah. he really like? Fuck, we know him. We've known him for years. So it was a, it was a great match. Now, do you think with this new three piece lineup, do you think you guys would actually do a new studio album? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, the day, uh, this is the truth, the day that. John and I and Al in 2014 decided to put the band together. I started writing that night. We tried to write with John for five years, which it was easy to write with John back in the day, but after five years, we had one song. <laughs> and uh, so that wasn't going too well. So, um, and when Daniel joined, we've just been touring and touring, and Al and I uh, have the album written. We just have to. Uh, pre prod it and hopefully next year we'll record it. We're now, definitely gonna put out a new album. Now do you think it'll have uh the feel of the same of the first four albums or do you I think don't it's gonna know, be man, first time you hear it, you tell me well, I'll say, I I'll, can't say oh it's gonna be this and it's gonna be that because I don't know. You know I'll say this as a as a fan perspective and being in this industry and doing the record labels and living and stuff like that yeah. is a, what I would say looking in because I've noticed a lot of bands from the eighties there's bands like Witch Cross from uh, Denmark. Yeah. They did Fit for Fight and then they came back in the two thousands did album. Yeah. And it sounded very, very modern, and it yeah. lost the kind of like the feel for what right. that band was. Yeah, I will say this live, you guys tonight. It sounded very '80s. The drums sounded heavy. There was none of these, there was none of these dumbass triggers. I don't think I could write anything <laughs> modern. <laughs> because the first well, thing I would say if, if, if Exciter put out a new record before I hear it, I'll be like, ah, oh, shit, man. I hope it don't sound all super polished and digitized. No, it ain't gonna sound like that. I'll tell you that right because now. Because it's, it's just gonna lose. No. The, it's just gonna lose that magic. I agree. I only know how to write one way, and um, when I'm writing, I fluctuate between Maniac, Violence and Force, Song of Love. I say, oh, that's got a little bit of Unveiling the Wicked feel to it. I absolutely oh, that's love got a little Unveiling bit of the Violence Wicked. and Force. Yeah. It's not like we're going out to try to write the next Heavy Metal Maniac. Yeah, yeah. Not, 
Um, but uh, with Al and I, when we get together and write, it, it's just, it's the first four albums, and, and that's all we know, really. And we would be false if we went out and tried to do something. Yeah. And we don't have to. I mean, why go out and try to sound like someone else when we're excited? You know? I think that, no, and I don't think a lot of the bands, like when they're like, we're back. I don't think they intentionally do it. I just think they've been out of the game so long, and they're just with the yeah, times like, yeah, you're right. you just record it like this now. Yeah, this is how sure. it's done now. Yeah. It's like, dude, dude it, what your yeah. sound is, that's not what, what the no. fans are going to yeah. be expecting. Yeah. You know, well, if they want that, they'll pick up a new modern band, oh, which course. is plenty to fucking choose from. Yeah, you can't go out and try to sound like everybody that came after you and you influenced some shit. Hey, let's sound like them. They're all fucking influenced by us. And, and you know, every time I've tried to outdo myself in the past in the studio and shit, my friends and peers always say, Dan, just be yourself, man, you know? And that's all I know. So the new material, I find myself... Hey, oh, this is kind of like heavy metal mania. Well, it's, I think this could be on Violence and Force. It's kind of long, or it fluctuates between the first four. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know about the production yet, but it ain't going to be super polished. I'll okay. tell you that. Oh, that's good. Now, so out of all the uh, records you've done, for you personally, what is your personal fare? Not the one that sold the best, not the fan favorite. Yeah. What do you personally enjoy the most that you're like, I'm the most proud of? I'm like Rob mm-hmm. Halford. I can't stand to listen to my voice. <laughs> so, okay. but um, to answer your question, long live the loud. Okay. Definitely. Um, I'm so proud of Heavy Metal Maniac, but I was 19 when I sang that, and I sang it all one It was supposed to be a demo tape, right? Yeah. So it's hard to listen to, all, although I understand why it is what it is, and Violence and Force too. But um, over the past, since... I don't know, maybe the past 10 years, I've really started to really uh, uh, love Unveiling the Wicked. Not that I didn't before, but... Um, well, it's funny because you say it, because a lot of the older guys, it seems like if there's one they don't like in the four, yeah. it's that one. Yeah. Personally, I love that one, but for me, that was the first one I bought. Yes. So that it was, was, that was always... change yeah. for the band. Well, you I, can see the difference in it, but I was like, I, was, I think it's yeah. great. I mean, I love the leads. I love... I, it, it is a little bit different, but I think it's great. Great. And we uh, see a lot of people don't know this, but Brian McPhee, who we brought in in 85 when John left, Al and I had a basement band with Brian McPhee when we were 15. Okay. So he was no stranger. And we had a week to get a guitarist. So it's like we called up Brian and brought him in. And Brian and I wrote that album in a oh, week. Oh, so that's in why a, it's a little different? In a week. We wrote Unveiling in a week. The whole album? In, in the Rods. You know the Rods? We went down to Cortland, New York. I called up Carl Kennedy and I said, Music for Nations is going to fucking kill me if I don't write an album. I said, Carl, can we come down there and uh, use your gear and, and write an album? We got a week. He goes, come on down, Dan. So we brought Brian down to Cortland and, and him and I and Al wrote it in a fucking week. And Music for Nations, were, our record company at the time, were really pissed off that John left and they're like, uh, Mr. Bina. don't think you're going to fuck off into the sunset without giving us an album. So. I'm really proud of the fact that we wrote that in a fucking week, and, and I think it's a really good album. It was a different direction for Exciter, but, uh, yeah. Well, it seems like you guys can write pretty strong, memorable songs then, and under pressure. Cause you, I didn't yeah. know that story you are saying about Long Live the Loud. The label called us, and, why did they yeah. want to, why did they, why did they feel they needed one more, like, why did they feel it was a song short? Because like, it was too short? Well, or, back or was, then, you know, they usually, what they did is before the release, they'll throw uh, out a compilation album with, with a song from a lot of bands, right? And, you know, usually bands do have extra tracks, but we never thought of it. And I'll never forget, they're like, where's your extra track? So me and Al, our shit was still set up at uh, Britannia Rose Studios. So me and Al went on the floor, and Al goes, oh, I got a riff. And I had a pen and a paper, and Al gave me the riff, and I fucking wrote down this gang thing and called it Feel the Knife in about a half an hour. Then we brought John in, and we recorded it. So we thought it was just going to be an extra track to go on a compilation or something. And next thing you know, it's a neat feat. Well, plus it's a really strong song, too. Oh, well, you know, like you just said, we write the best under pressure. Well, I think I, I've heard the story secondhand, supposedly, or maybe they thought it was just going to be like a filler turd. Black Sabbath said the same thing about the song Paranoid. Yeah. Something along that lines. Like, when we wrote that, we just thought, like, all right, this is going to be a filler. <laughs> that's like, you know, that's, and I, I, I don't know if that's true, but I've heard that. I'm like, oh, that's, that's pretty funny. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like true, man. Hits. You fucking work on a song, work it to death. Yeah, some t- yeah you beat right? that It ends horse. up being the third song on side two. Yeah. And the one you wrote in 20 fucking minutes. And I'll tell you the truth right here. 
Violence and Force, Stand Up and Fight, Heavy Metal Maniac, and I can go on. Pounding Metal. I bet. I right, Pounding Metal is definitely. We never one of spent any more than a half an hour on them. And I jotted down lyrics on my floor, Tom. And uh, that's what's on there today. And uh, everything happened quick, quick, quick. Um, well, it's funny you say, it's like a song like Pounding Metal. In my mind, there's a few songs, In League with Satan by Venom's one of them. It's, to me, I look at those as like national metal anthems. Yeah. And it was written so fast. It's, uh, <laughs> and if we would have taken something home, fuck, nobody would remember to give a shit. That's the way we worked. And we never recorded anything back then. Everything was by memory. We'd go to rehearsal and write a bunch of songs, come back to the next place, do it the same, do it the same, write some more. I think back now and I think, holy shit, we didn't even fucking take a cassette home or anything. It was all by memory. And whatever the hell we did that night, when we wrote Pounding Metal, I remember Al's doing the riff. And I was on this Eric Carr thing, uh, I Love It Loud, and I was going, ding, ding, do, 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 and do, 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 do. And then John comes out and they start playing and I start singing the lyrics and I swear to God, like a half an hour later, the fucking song is written and the roadies are freaking out. And that was it. Oh, this is great. <laughs> and uh, the same with Violence and Forest. One day I wrote down all three verses and I had the chorus in my head. Um, went in, half an hour, it's done. Long Live the Loud, I was walking around, I was living with my parents and I was walking around the living room writing songs for the Long Live the Loud album. And uh, I had Long Live Rock and Roll on by Rainbow. And I'm walking around going, fucking long live something. Oh, so that, that's where you get the album. I'm okay. going, long live something. I'm yeah, going to make yeah. a fucking statement, and it's going to be on our album like that with the rivets and everything. I'm going, long live. And then I go, long live the loud. Long live. And meanwhile, Dio's going, long live. And I go, thanks, Dio. And I went. <laughs> it's funny. And, I never put two and two together. Like, yeah, yeah that's funny. So I went, and I wrote down all three fucking verses. And, that, and I knew the chorus. I don't play guitar. So... But I bring the melodies to the guys, so I had the chorus long live. But anyway, the last verse, keeping ahead, waking the dead. I got a mind blank, and I'm sitting there, and I had an old, I can't remember if it was Kerrang or Metal Hammer or whatever. There was that famous picture of, of Venom where they're on a fucking pile of junk. And Abaddon's at oh, the top like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm going, keeping ahead, waking the dead. I looked at the picture, and I went, on top of your wreckage we stand and i went that is a fucking song and i brought it in that night and we did it and uh quick the best exciter songs i swear to god we never spent more than a half an hour and that's lyrics and when i fucking finish the lyrics sometimes on my floor tom and that same with unveiling the wicked unveiling the wicked i had no lyrics all i had was a pad and a paper and the more brian played the riffs i said hold on guys Hold on, and everything I scribbled there in the Rod's rehearsal thing went on the album. And uh, I just think it's because it's got, it's got that raw energy. I think that's probably what it is. It's just yeah. the first thing comes from the heart. It yeah. comes from your heart. It comes from the heart. It's fucking and real. You don't overthink A week it later, all oh, the bridge used to be the fucking verse, and this you, yeah. you don't know where the hell it is, and it's no longer from here. Whatever comes out first is usually for me anyway. I, I it, it's the best. Go. And those first four albums are bang, 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 from the heart, everything, energy, high five, and there's our fucking song. But we had no idea at the time yeah. that yeah, I'd be 61 years old and it'd still be going, but that's how it worked for us. Uh, having said that, how many more years do you think you got in you? I don't know, brother, but uh, I'll play it. As long as everybody, like tonight, you know. Pull let me just do it till you die. I'll do it till I die, man. As long as everybody's out there. Yeah. Yeah, Looks like Ozzy's sure. going to. Yeah. I, I, I can't yeah. believe that guy's still alive, personally. Yeah. Well, I got a few years to go before I'm their age. Yeah, but I think he but, probably, I mean, Grant, I don't know what kind of lifestyle you're living. I think he, he partied it a little bit oh, harder than yeah. anybody. No, I don't party that hard, but uh, <laughs> maybe in the 80s. <laughs> right. But yeah, I'll do it as long as I can. But the metal, metal keeps us young and is. As long as the young people and earlier you saw tonight in our dressing room, there's a 14-year-old. Like, uh, yeah, come on, man, I'm going to be in a, I'm going to be in a pine box, and they're still going to be listening to it. Yeah. He's old enough to be your grandson it's for crazy. sure. Easily. And the future of metal, and as long as I'm healthy enough and I can get out there, it, it, it's it's pretty surreal. As I say, as I say, it's pretty surreal to kind of see the new generations already embracing the work that you did. It's crazy, yeah, yeah. and they have tattoos and shit. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. for life, man. Right. That's what I'm and they're kids. It's uh, 
How is it's your fan? So I'd imagine your fan base, and I, I'm just guessing here, uh, but in Germany, I would assume it's insane. I just seem like Exciter would be very popular in Germany because I know that all over Europe. But you saw Cleveland tonight. Everybody over here thinks Europe is crazy, and everybody over there thinks. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> no, it's true, man. Yeah, but it's I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> fuck, man. Anybody from Germany was here tonight. They yeah, shook their fucking pants. It, it's in that little room too, United so it was. States, yeah, it was we were lucky enough that uh, it was a good crowd. We, we got tonight. a hold in the United States in, in 1983, 84, and it's never stopped. And we're fucking proud of that. And I'll tell you, anywhere we play in the U.S., there's no fucking different in Europe. And this isn't better than that. And that they're heavy metal fans with a big fucking heart for metal, and they come out. I don't care if it's Cleveland or fucking Berlin. Well, I gotta say, I think part of it, what it was tonight, I'm no fucking sound engineer, so I don't know what the deal is. I don't know if they just, they just change, because I'm at this club all the time, right? Yeah. I don't know if they just fixed their goddamn sound or whatever, but when I walked in there, I'm like, holy shit, this sounds amazing. Or yeah, you well, guys are just great. No, you know what? Because the, the bass sounded good, yeah, the yeah. drums, I was like, this sounds we fucking We travel with a sound man that- It's gotta be something. I was like, dude, awesome, it has man. something. I was like, I was like, he, to trust me, I'm the biggest yeah. critic. So I'm like, this sucks. I was like, I can't hear the vocals. Bass, pff, just yeah. get rid of them. You can't even hear them. Yeah. I was like, I, I was like, this, holy shit, this is like, sounds awesome. Oh, yeah. Scotty, our sound man. He's, so that uh, has to have something to do with it, because I'm like, no, oh, this definitely, is great. Oh, definitely, man. He, he, well, at least you know he's paying off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, you, you play clubs here and there on the band the night before, fucked everything up. I was up, in that room. I, I missed the first two songs, because some yeah. some jackass was yakking my ear off. Yeah. So I, I didn't see what the first two songs he played, but I was in the rest, and it just sounded metal to the bone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would attribute a lot of that to Scotty, our cell man. Well, I'll, 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 uh, keep, I'll keep him on the crew. Yeah. Oh, man. He, uh, it it's, makes a huge difference because, like I said, you know, when you're playing clubs, you're at the mercy of whoever the fuck used the PA the night before and fucked yeah. it all up. And, and Scotty comes in and cleans it all up, and, and uh, we sound like Exciter. And it, it, it's very important because people spend a lot of money for a ticket, and they want to sound a pile of shit. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Actually, that kind of sets the bar, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. And the taste of how that experience can be. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah, because well, it was, it was sure. kind of used to like that. Uh, you kind of used to dog. Yeah, kind of used to well, dog. Yeah, man. Yeah, I agree. Like, you get your money's worth and difference. you're entertained. And yeah. like you said, man, you're there and you can't hear the fucking vocals yeah. or you can't hear this and you're thinking, oh. Dude, there's times, it's been, been, there's been, and sometimes it's death metal, so maybe it's a little bit more ear fatigue. Yeah. But bands that I know their songs very well, there's yeah. been shows I went to, I'm like, what song are they on? Yeah. I was like, I know their songs. Yeah, we it all. It sounded that bad. Yeah, yeah, we all go through that. But yeah, uh, yeah. you want to get over that, just bring yourself a good sound, man, because uh, it makes a huge difference. Young Bucks, sure. listen up. <laughs> well, Dan, I didn't want to take up too much of your time unless you got anything to add, subtract, promote, say, whatever the fuck you want to say. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time, man. We really appreciate it. and. Um, you got a bunch of shows next? Yeah, we got a whole tour going. This is only the third oh, night. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, we played. I just see Cleveland. Like, that's the one I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah, we played. We started off at Reggie's. I, I didn't know that. I knew yeah. you played Chicago because my buddies. Yeah, like, yeah no, we played Chicago. Detroit last night. Okay, Detroit. Okay. And then, holy shit, man, we so played Cleveland to... sold out tonight. How many? Fuck. How many? How many I more? Don't know. You... We got what? Like how many more shows? Huh? Like fourteen or something like that. Okay. We're shit. doing a whole East Coast thing, and then we're going to the West Coast, and uh, it's long overdue, man. Yeah. You know, it really is. Yeah, I didn't know where you were at the yeah. tour. I, okay. Cool. Yeah. So well. <laughs> and thank you all, the fucking Exciter fans, young and old, that have our back all this time, and I'll kill myself to come out and play for you, man. As long as you're there, that's what metal's all about. So yeah, in your town, if Exciter's playing, go see him. You won't be disappointed, goddammit. I wasn't. Later. <laughs>